Hey everybody, today I'm going to be talking about Flowers for Algernon, A Night of the Seven Kingdoms, In Ascension, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, The Short Story, Lonely Castle in the Mirror, which will include a mini rant, and I'll start out talking about Grand Conspiracy by Jenny Wirtz. I'm going to be very vague about this book because it is book five in an 11 book series, so I don't want to spoil anyone for anything, and I will be hosting a spoiler-filled discussion on this book here on my channel including Philip Chase and A.P. Canavan from A Critical Dragon. But um, what I will say about this book is it is from an 11 book series and book 11 is going to be published this year in May. If you're curious about thoughts, Nico from Nico's Book Reviews did read that last book and loved it. This series has replaced his love of Wheel of Time, so it's his number one favorite series now. What I can say spoiler free is that the book does live up to its name, Grand Conspiracy. There's quite a bit of scheming in this book. The plot work is excellent. There are so many things that are set up from previous books that tie into this book. And it has a very satisfying ending in my opinion. I really love the way this book ended. And I will say too that things I continue to love about this series include the mystical, ethereal magic, the history and lore of the world, the character work for the most part, I'll get to that in a second, and the romantic elements as well. I really love the romantic elements and the dynamics between male and female characters. I will admit when it comes to characters that I do have a bias in this series towards the female characters. I enjoy some of the main male characters but I find that when there are both male and female characters on the page, that's when I tend to enjoy the book the most, the series the most. And I'm just speaking from my own experience, but there is one character that I personally don't enjoy in this series. And it's it's been a really tough thing for me. So there's a character named Dakar, who's a sorcerer, and he gets a lot of focus in this series, but he gets a lot of attention humorous attention regarding his size, being a heavier person, and I don't think that humor has, has aged well. He also gets a lot of, uh, I think, a humorous attention based on the fact that he's constantly drunk and sleeping with women, and there's great explanation in the series as to why he does what he does and why he ended up in that situation, why he ended up in those patterns, in those destructive patterns. And I understand that. At the same time, he's just not an enjoyable character for me to read about. And I keep hoping I'll change my mind. And I almost did in my favorite book of this series, in Warhouse to Vastmark, which is book three. I started to have a turnaround in how I felt about him. And then it kind of switched back to me not enjoying this character as much. And as far as the humor not aging well, there are a lot of things I feel like I overlook because I read a lot of older sci-fi and fantasy. And so I recognize a lot of things that don't age very well. And this particular book was written around 24 years ago, I believe. I think it said it was published in 2000. So I'm always forgiving of things to a certain extent that maybe were acceptable at a time that are no longer acceptable today. But it's just not my kind of humor. It's just not something that I enjoy reading about. And I have found this character start to grate on me more and more as I read this series. And unfortunately, he gets a lot of page time. Now, to be fair, I also did not like Krupp or Krupp in Malaz and Book of the Fallen in book one. I know that's a very controversial opinion, but I didn't enjoy that character in Malazan until book three, Memories of Ice. I had a shift with that character. So I kept holding out hope I would change my mind about Dakar. But right now, like I said, I'm really struggling with that character, even though I understand that this character is set up the way they are set up in order to subvert certain expectations, in order to flip the underdog trope. But it's just not a character, like I said, that I personally enjoy. And, you know, no shame to those who do enjoy that character. I know I'm very much in the minority about that. But the things that I am loving in this series, I am continuing to love. So that's all I could say moving forward. I am continuing to enjoy this series for the most part, despite that. And I really look forward to talking spoilers with A Critical Dragon and Philip Chase. Flowers for Algernon is a must-read sci-fi classic following Charlie Gordon a man with a very low intelligence level or low IQ, and he is selected to undergo a surgery that will rapidly increase his intelligence level, and this is following the successful trials with a lab rat named Algernon. And this is a very emotional story as we learn early on what it means to Charlie to become intelligent, how being intelligent means 
friendship. It means connection. It means love. It means fulfilling these deeper needs that he doesn't really quite understand. And you learn as he goes through this journey, whether he gets what he wants. What I love about this book, in addition to the emotional journey and questions regarding intelligence and love and connection, is the writing style and how the writing style corresponds to that journey. This is told in first person narration in an epistolary format. And so I really appreciated how the journal entries at the beginning reflected Charlie's views of things and also his thought process. The sentences are very simple. There are grammatical errors. And as his intelligence increases, you notice that reflected in the writing style. You notice when critical thinking skills start to emerge. You notice when his sentence structures become more complex, more thoughtful, and more well-written. And I just thought that was so well captured in the story, but it is a very emotional journey, as I mentioned, and it really incorporates quite a few themes. I mean, not only about science, head versus heart, I think that's one way that the book explores this experiment, but also about relationships, romantic relationships in particular, and whether they could be successful if one partner is quite a bit more intelligent than the other partner. It also explores family relationships and trauma, especially as he starts to have certain memories emerge from his past and has to make sense of those things, especially regarding some very mentally abusive episodes that Charlie goes through with his mother, especially regarding his perceptions of sex and also identity and how those memories affect identity or how his intelligence level affects his sense of identity. So a lot is explored in this story, and like I said, it's quite um, an emotional read, quite an important read regarding themes. I had mentioned before that I wasn't sure if I had read this in high school or not. I seem to have some memory of reading it, but I don't remember reading a full book. And I think what might have happened is that I read the abridged short story. I found an abridged short story PDF online, and it basically tackles many of the same themes in a 31 page document, but of course omits a lot of things, especially some of the sexual content that's explored in this story. But I think that this is an important story. So even if you read the abridged version in middle school, either way, I think that this is a very important story. Also, it was meaningful to me because when I was a kid, I really struggled with feeling like I was stupid, with feeling like my intelligence level was much lower than average. And unfortunately, this was reinforced by certain teachers I had. I have very specific memories of my first grade teacher belittling me that have stayed with me my whole life. And I actually remember conversations with my mother when I was younger about wishing I were gifted, wishing I were very intelligent. And my mother telling me, you think you want that, but you might not really want that. It might be the case that people who are gifted, who are above average intelligence, they might struggle. They might have difficulties with relationships. You just don't know. And of course, I think she was thinking of outliers, like the case in this book. It stood out to me. It, that memory stood out to me as I was reading this story, and I, re I was reflecting back on my own experiences in ways that I could kind of relate to Charlie and what he believed. So this was a very meaningful read and definitely a must read for most people. I highly recommend it. A Night of the Seven Kingdoms includes three novellas that take place approximately a hundred years prior to A Game of Thrones, the first book in A Song of Ice and Fire. And in these three novellas, we follow Dunk, an imposter hedge knight, and Egg, who is a bald eight-year-old boy who you find out has more to him as you read on. So these three stories follow this very contrasting dynamic duo. They're very complementary to each other because Egg is very witty, very knowledgeable, helps to get Dunk out of some sticky situations at times. Whereas Dunk, even though he's an imposter hedge knight, he's very headstrong, he's very big and brawny. He says to himself, Dunk the Lunk, thicker than a castle wall. So he doesn't think much of his intelligence, but he's always trying to do the right thing. So a lot of the theme that is explored in this story or in these stories is about knighthood and what is a true knight or words just wind when it comes to vows as that ties into the main series. But one question I constantly had when I was reading these stories is about whether Dunk, this imposter knight, would have made the choices that he made in these three stories, which were quite 
honorable, which were quite aligned with the values of being a true knight? Would he have made those choices if he had not been an imposter knight? If he didn't have that title hovering over his head that he's supposed to be a hedge knight, would he have done the, the same things? Would he have acted the same way? Because the true knights in this story aren't quite as honorable in most cases. So I really enjoyed that kind of exploration, but I also enjoyed the humor in these stories, especially in the second novella when Egg is giving advice to Dunk about how to be gallant and how to talk to a lady. And also the way that Dunk is constantly threatening to clout Egg if he doesn't do what he's told. And you know that I just got the impression anyway that Dunk would never do that. Also, I loved the atmosphere in these novellas, whether it had to do with the tournament in the first novella, the hum in the air of a tournament, how there was a puppeteer over here, there were food vendors, there's an armor, and then just the jousting itself at the tournament, the, the feelings of being on the field, or the atmosphere of summer in Westeros. We all know how brutal, at least those of us who have read A Song of Ice and Fire, know how brutal the winter can be in Westeros, but it was quite a contrast to read how how harsh the summers were, especially with the drought that's depicted in the second novella, and also the atmosphere of the wedding in the third novella, the drunken atmosphere, the song, the bear and the maiden fair. I just love those cultural touches that are present even if 100 years prior. I also have to highlight the plot work, which I thought was exceptional, especially in the third story, considering all the reveals, all the things that tie into the main series and how these events become historical over time. So there were so many things I appreciated in all three novellas. The first one was probably my favorite for whatever reason, but again, I was really impressed with the plot work in the third story. The one drawback I would say, at least for me personally, and this isn't this isn't really a criticism of the of the of these novellas by any means. I would actually reread these novellas. I really enjoyed them. But I think the one drawback is that we didn't really get a lot of good female perspectives. And that's not the point. This is mostly following, like I said. Duncan Egg, and I loved Duncan Egg. I loved the character work. I loved the dynamics between these two characters. But one thing I love about A Song of Ice and Fire, an association I have with A Song of Ice and Fire, are the multiple perspectives, and especially the female perspectives, which are some of my favorite female perspectives in fantasy. I love all the characters in A Song of Ice and Fire. I was just a little bummed not to get more fleshed out female characters. I think they are portrayed with a very strong male gaze, which I feel like is understandable because we're in Dunk's perspective. And Dunk is very young and very naive. He's very virginal, I think. So I understand that, but I don't know. That was the one thing that I felt like was missing for me personally as a huge A Song of Ice and Fire female character fan. I guess one thing I'll add is that I wouldn't necessarily recommend these novellas if you haven't read A Song of Ice and Fire. Even though they provide a little bit of a lighter tone, I felt like I enjoyed them more as a result of being familiar with a lot of the houses and names in A Song of Ice and Fire. So I just want to offer that in case you're interested. I'm glad I finally got to them though as a long time A Song of Ice and Fire fan. The Death of Ivan Ilyich is a short story by Tolstoy, and I received this wonderful collection from Matt, a wonderful friend and viewer here. I only read that one short story, but I do intend to read the rest of the collection at some point. And I was so impressed with this particular short story. I did pick it up thanks to Jimmy from the Fantasy Network because he compared it to Stoner. I can see why. I'll get to why here in a minute. But this particular short story it confronts death, mortality, social elitism, and fragility, the fragility of being human. So we start out in this story with Ivan Ilyich's funeral. There's a colleague of his who goes to the funeral and approaches the coffin. And when he sees he sees Ivan in the coffin, he notes the expression on Ivan's face. And it, it sounded just like the cover of this book. I feel I felt like the description really matched the cover here. But when he notices this expression on Yvonne's face, he considers it a reproach or warning to the living and not in a personal way. So you're left wondering as a reader, I was left wondering as a reader, what is the warning? Why does he have this reproachful expression on his face? And by the way, that description of Yvonne lying in the coffin, 
that was such an excellent description in the story. It was what immediately pulled me into the story. I loved the writing style, which I'll get to in more depth here in a minute. But the story then goes backwards and outlines Ivan's life, including events that lead to his death, to his illness, and then to his death. One thing that was interesting learning about this character, Ivan, is that he seemed pretty normal according to his societal upbringing. Like I said, I think that this story tackles social elitism quite a bit. He doesn't end up on either extreme end as his older brother and younger brother. He's a middle child and he seems to grow up according to those values. But as he gets older, he becomes more and more ambitious with his job and, and seeks to increase his employment status. He ends up getting married and he learns as he works in law, he works in a courtroom. He learns to compartmentalize his life and strictly boundary his, his life according to life stuff and work stuff. And he's very severe in his dealings with those two things. And as a result, when he gets sick, when he starts to become ill, those boundaries start to blur. This character reminded me of people I know, people with the approach of business is business, nothing personal. And then when illness starts to set in, then your humanity starts to set in. You start to realize that you're a lot more fragile than you might have thought. And, and I feel like illness in this story is a catalyst for Yvonne to consider whether he lived his life well or not. And the way that Tolstoy writes that confrontation of that question is so powerful. So I found this short story so compelling, so impactful. And I think that Tolstoy has a gift for depicting human behavior as absurd without effort, without force. He just shows human behavior according to these societal norms, and it looks absurd. I won't give away details in case they're spoilery, but I, I thought that that was very well handled in the story. And in that regard, it did remind me a little bit of Stoner. I feel like I could see elements of Stoner in the story. I could definitely see the comparison that Jimmy made, the way that the prose flows and is laid out in such a clear way, but there's always more to unpack. I think it's that kind of story, certainly, but also far more cynical in my opinion than Stoner, but I really loved it. I'm so glad I read this. So thank you to Jimmy Nuts and thank you to Matt for gifting me this wonderful collection. In Ascension is what I would describe as a blend between literary fiction and science fiction. It's a very intimate story told in first person narration following microbiologist Lee. We start out at the beginning learning about the trauma she endured with a very abusive father, the silent play she had with her sister and her mother who was an academic who suffered from migraines. Early on, Lee ends up having an epiphany when she goes into the ocean. I don't want to say much about that because I think it's more fun to read about that yourself if you're going to read the book, but this ends up changing her whole entire life, the whole direction of her life and her interest in science. And from there, she ends up going on a couple of different expeditions. One is in the depths of the ocean to find the earliest form of life on Earth. And then next, she ends up being part of a food program for a space exploration. I'll just keep it there as far as the plot is concerned. That's not giving away much more than what's on the back of the book. But again, I think that this story is a very intimate one. It's one that really goes into the psychology of space travel. It goes into environmental themes. It tackles this question of what it means to be human. What does it mean to be human on Earth and outside of Earth? I also see a lot of parallels to Solaris, which I'm currently reading by Stanislaw Lem. And I could definitely see the, the journey of going outward reflecting the journey going inward, because that's the case for Lee. Every time she seeks to explore and to go outward, she is constantly reflecting or the journey is constantly reflecting the psychological journey, going back to her roots, going back to her past. This is what I would describe as a very thematically cohesive story because every time you get a conversation or a segment that feels a little inconsequential, just like a little life moment, it is thematically threaded back into the story. And I really love the way this author, he brings a lot of attention to these moments and makes them impactful and meaningful without being loud. And I, I appreciated that so much in the story. It pulled me in. It's a very introspective story, but 
On the flip side, I also think that's why this story will be very boring for a lot of readers because it is so introspective, even though we're dealing with some broad ideas. I want to also say that we get a perspective towards the end that recontextualizes our perspective of Lee. As I said, we're in her head. And there's an ending piece to the story, the very end. It's in five parts. The fifth part was, was a bit of a leap for me. I read the story and then I got to the end and I understood how it thematically worked. I completely understood what the author was going for in a thematic way, but I wasn't totally sure how we got where we got. And then fortunately, I buddy read this with Jimmy and Murphy and Jimmy was able to point out a connection point that was mentioned a section or two earlier. And once he pointed that out, it all clicked together. And then I felt much more settled about it. So I actually really enjoyed my journey reading this story, but I can understand, again, why this wouldn't appeal to a lot of people. I think even though it blends literary fiction and science fiction quite well, I still think that this is probably going to appeal to people who are more into literary fiction. I loved the, psycho the psychology part, but I don't know that the, the science fiction part is mm, as in-depth as some people would want. I'm going to go ahead and talk about character work and echo a little bit of what Murphy said in her vlog. I think that the characters in this story certainly do seem a little bit more subdued in some ways, and I think part of the reason for that is that we are in Lee's head, and Lee is constantly describing characters, but you don't get a lot of interaction off the page with them. So I didn't feel like those were characters that would stay in my memory long term as a result of that. But the moments that we do have dialogue and we do have direct interaction, I found those moments very, very impactful. I thought they were very well written. I really loved the writing style in this book. And just like I was complimentary toward Flowers for Algernon with the writing style corresponding to the psychological state of the character in first person narration, I felt that was definitely the case in this story with Lee. I greatly appreciate that because none of us are going to have consistent experiences all the time. Different experiences are going to lead our consciousness to be different, to the organization of thought to be different. So to me, it makes sense to change your writing style when you're in first person narration to match the character. So I, I personally appreciate when an author does it, but I didn't feel it was done in a jarring way. I felt like the story still flowed really well. And I loved my buddy read experience with Jimmy and Murphy. It was just so much fun to share thoughts with them. Now for Lonely Castle in the Mirror, which will include my mini rant. And my mini rant is not about the book itself. My mini rant is about the blurb on the back. This book is what I would describe as a middle grade story, maybe even cozy fantasy might work for this story, but it follows a 13 year old girl, Kokoro, who ends up missing a lot of school. You find out as you read the story why, but as she's home during the day, she discovers that a mirror in her house turns into a portal that leads her into this other dimension where there's a fantasy castle much akin to a Disney fantasy castle. And in this setting, she ends up meeting six other kids who also got there through mirror portals. And in addition to the six other kids, there is this young girl with the wolf mask. And this young girl lays out the rules that they're allowed to be there to make use of the castle during the day up until around, I think, 4 p.m. And then from there, they have to go back through the mirror into the port, their homes through the portal. Otherwise, they might get eaten by a wolf. And also that there's a hidden key in this castle that could unlock a hidden wishing room where one of them could get a wish, anything they want. The kids in the first half of the story, they end up trying to look for this key. They're not super ambitious about it, but they do try. They can't find the key, but they end up making use of the castle. Each of them has their own designated room, but they end up spending a lot of time in a common room, playing video games, talking with one another, or in the kitchen talking. They get to know one another, build friendships. And then the second half of the story goes into some really interesting plot reveals. I really enjoyed the way that the story transformed. The first half of the story almost felt to me like a Japanese kid's breakfast club. That was what I thought of, like the breakfast club movie. But I really enjoyed this story. It's all about loneliness, friendship. It does deal with some mental health stuff in a very sensitive way, one that I think is very appropriate for middle grade readers. 
And it also, it also goes into the power of friendship, not only to reconcile loneliness, but also to help reframe difficult situations to provide a sense of resiliency going forward in life. Again, this is a Japanese translated work. It was translated from Japanese to English by Philip Gabriel. So the prose is very straightforward and clear. It's not lyrical, but it tells the story very well. And I, I don't know. I don't know how to assess prose from a translated work. It's always hard in that regard. It was a prize-winning Japanese number one bestseller, and there is an afterword in the story that talks about that talks about Japanese children ranked second to last in an international survey assessing children's mental health. So I'll go ahead and post that note on the screen. But my actual rant about this book has nothing to do with the story itself. It has to do with the blurb on the back. So there's a blurb on the back that says, Strange and beautiful. Imagine the offspring of the wind-up bird chronicle and the virgin suicides. If any of you have read Murakami's The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle, which I have many years ago, then you understand how absurd that statement is. And if you've watched the movie The Virgin Suicides or read the book, I haven't done either, but I did look up a blurb about The Virgin Suicides, which is about a suicide pact. Also, very unsettling and doesn't make me feel like that would be appropriate for middle grade. But The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle has nothing to do with the story. It is nothing like the story. That book is very much for adult readers. The only common thread I can imagine between this book and The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle is that both are set in Tokyo. Both of them are a type of fantasy. The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle is more magical realism. But with this story, it's a middle grade book. And being compared to two adult works really doesn't do it any favors. I talked about this with Gavin and Becca on Why Read because both of them did not know this was middle grade. And Evie from She Was Only Evie gifted this to me. She already read it. She said people were complaining at the time that it's not thematically subtle. And I was thinking, this is a middle grade book. Give it a break. For me, this is just what I needed. I actually picked this up knowing it was middle grade. I think I saw one reviewer say it was middle grade, and I think that helped my expectations even though the blurb on the back obviously doesn't do a good job of that. But for me, it really helped knowing that going in because this satisfied my need for something that was a little bit more lighthearted, especially after reading Annika Vaughn's Ice last month or a couple months ago. I just needed a heartwarming read and this, this satisfied me. So I might pick up more middle grade fantasy in the future. It's not a genre I'm well read in or not an age group of fantasy I'm well read in. And so I don't know how it holds up to other middle grade fantasy, but I loved it. And if you pick it up, please let me know your thoughts. And that's about it for this recent reads, reviews type of video. Please let me know in the comment section below if you've read any of these books, if you're planning to read any of these books. And thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.